Hello, and thank you for joining me today for a discussion on the strategies that can be employed for obtaining accurate results when analyzing samples for rare earth elements using a multi-quadrupole ICPMS. Sorry for the mouthful there, but my name is Andrew Rams, and I am a field application specialist with Perkin Elmer. Through the following presentation, I will help to explain some of the issues that you may face when analyzing these types of samples by an ICPMS and how you can overcome them. I would like to start this presentation with a quick overview of the reasons why we care about rare earth elements and why we look for rare earth element deposits and move into the specific challenges faced when analyzing samples for rare earth elements, as well as a quick overview of the features of a multi-quadrupole ICPMS like the Nexion 5000, which can help you to achieve accurate results. I'll finish off with a discussion of two rare earth element applications. The first for the analysis of exploration samples for rare earth elements, as well as some other elements. And the second, on analyzing high purity rare earth element samples for other rare earth element impurities that may be present. When the term rare earth elements, or REE for short, is used, it typically refers to a group of elements, including the lanthanide series, as well as scandium and yttrium. REEs have many uses in the advanced technology and electronics that are utilized in automobiles, airplanes, camera lenses, medical devices, televisions, smartphones, and computers, to name a few. There's a growing demand for REEs to support technological advancement, and the search for larger REE deposits and quality ore materials is ongoing. So let's jump right into the challenges that can be faced when analyzing for REE. Since raw geological materials that contain REE are usually only found in low concentrations, an important component of geological exploration is being able to accurately quantify and detect REEs in the collected samples, since this ultimately helps to determine the viability of new mine sites and can help to expand existing sites. It's also important to consider the sample preparation used and the measurement method used. There are three common methods used to analyze REE in geological materials, those being inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, or ICPMS, X-ray fluorescence, XRF, and instrumental neutron activation analyses, or INAA. While both INAA and XRF have their own respective advantages and disadvantages, they both suffer from poor detection limits when compared to ICPMS. And this is quite necessary when the detection limits uh, of low concentration REEs are considered. For this reason, the measurement of REE by ICPMS following sample preparation is a widely used analytical technique. But appropriate sample preparation before analysis by ICPMS is crucial in order to deliver accurate results where this is usually either a fusion technique or some form of acid digestion, usually a four acid digestion. Depending on the preparation method chosen, various complications to the analysis may be introduced and the preparation technique of fusing samples in lithium borate flux is widely used in samples that are very refractory and otherwise hard to digest. Now that we've decided on using an ICPMS for this analysis, what are the main challenges that we can face? Well, there are four main issues to overcome. Those being having a high matrix solution, which can lead to plasma loading, having a wide range in element concentrations, definitely the consideration of having multiple isotopic interferences, especially with these complex matrices, as well, we need to consider long run stability. Before we consider those four main obstacles, let's discuss the Nexion series ICPMS and the many features that make it a good instrument for geochemical analysis, including the analysis of REE. There are a number of shared features between the models, as you can see in this table. 
I'll cover these different features as we continue our discussion, but the main differences between the models is the number of gas lines, which is important for flexibility for gas-based interference removal. But there are two other major differences to consider as well. Probably the most obvious difference between these models is that on the Nexion 5000, there is the inclusion of an additional transmission analyzer quadrupole between the quadrupole and deflector, labeled as Q0, and the universal cell, labeled as Q2. While the Nexion 1000 and 2000 models are still very sensitive and effective models of ICE-PMS, the multiple quadrupoles of the Nexion 5000 provide an additional level of ion beam control that I will go on to describe in coming slides. Possessing multiple quadrupoles within the Nexion 5000 allows for multiple strategies to be used in removing interferences that could cause false readings in unknown samples. These quadrupoles include a 90 degree quadrupole ion deflector labeled as Q0 that selectively focuses ions maximizing signal intensity and eliminating neutral species and photons. A full-sized resolving quadrupole, Q1, that is used to remove the matrix ions from the ion beam, ensuring that a tightly focused ion beam of all the same mass to charge ratio reaches the universal cell. Next, we have the universal cell itself, Q2, which is a true quadrupole and is able to accommodate gases that react with either the analyte or the interferent in a controlled and reliable manner, efficiently removing interferences and rejecting side reactions using dynamic bandpass tuning. The ions then pass to a final full-sized analyzer quadrupole, Q3, for mass separation, and then are followed by the detection by the detector. The other obvious addition to the Nexion 5000 is the new Omniring technology, which allows a voltage to be applied behind the hyperskimmer to optimize ion flow from the plasma, enhancing sensitivity and allowing analysis to take place in different modes of operation. Extraction, focusing, cold plasma, and even customizable modes. The unique design of the Omni ring provides a more stable design over that of the multiple plate lens design and also allows for an easy removal and cleaning when needed. But now we've looked at a few key components of the Nexion platform, let's get back to the main topic at hand. Let's first discuss the high matrix solutions that we need to analyze from these rare earth element samples and what effect this has on plasma loading. When injecting a sample with a high matrix or high concentration into a plasma, there is the possibility that you can destabilize the plasma or definitely cool the plasma. But all Nexion ICPMSs are fitted with a Lumi coil rather than a traditional copper load coil. These coils are self-cooling, meaning that they do not suffer from water or argon leaks like the traditional copper coils. And they're also chemically resistant, so they do not suffer from oxidation or from pitting as copper coils do. And essentially, they are paired to a new generation of solid state RF generator to provide optimal plasma coupling, even with these harsh matrices, such as those found in lithium borate fused samples. Another way to overcome issues presented by the sample type is what we call the all matrix solution, or AMS for short, which is an online gas dilution system. Basically, a stream of argon gas is injected into a port on the neck of the spray chamber. This reduces the concentration of droplets in the aerosol stream before it enters the plasma, thus diluting the sample. As well as diluting the sample, it has the added benefit of increasing the ionization efficiency by not cooling the plasma as much 
and lowers the rate of deposition on the cones, providing better long-term stability as well. This dilution effect can be tuned to any ratio that may be required by the user, uh, and it is up to a maximum of 200 times dilution. Another common issue is that elements can be in vastly different concentrations from one another in both exploration samples and of course when looking at impurities in high purity samples. As well, it is often important to measure the major elements as well as the trace elements. Traditionally, major elements are run on an ICP OES and trace on an ICP MS meaning the sample needs to be split and an extra dilution step added in for the ICPMS analysis. However, there are ways to avoid having to do this additional step. The Nexion series ICPMS has an extended dynamic range due to the unique ability to perform an added electronic dilution in the universal cell. The electronic dilution can be added to any individual element within your method and does not add any time to the overall analysis. As you can see in the graph in the bottom right, the signal of sodium can be easily attenuated using the system. So how does it work? The electronic dilution is added in the method by entering a value in the rejection parameter A or RPA column. This alters the DC voltage of the quadrupole set and begins to reject the ions of the selected mass to charge ratio from the cell. Increasing the RPA value rejects more ions and reduces overall ion intensity at the selected mass, which keeps the intensity in a range that does not exceed the detector and allows for the analysis of high concentration elements without the need for any additional dilution. Electronic dilution not only allows for the analysis of high concentration elements, but it also protects the detector and extends its life. And now probably the most important consideration and challenge when analyzing rare earth element samples on an ICPMS is the possibility of multiple isotopic interferences, both isobaric and polyatomic in nature, uh, that can definitely have major implications on your results and your accuracy when trying to quantify rare earth elements in samples. At the heart of any Nexion ICPMS instrument is its universal cell technology. The universal cell allows for both KED and DRC gas modes to be run to remove interferences. KED mode is primarily used to reduce polyatomic interferences uh, by the injection of an inert gas, typically helium, whereas DRC mode can offer superior detection limits uh, as it's more targeted reactions based on reaction kinetics of either the target analyte or the interferent analytes. So we can make use of the reaction gas to do a mass shift, and we can shift our target analyte to a higher mass, creating an oxide or some sort of uh, compound. Or we can use the uh, reactive gas to react with the interferent itself and try to maybe do a proton transfer and make a neutral or other types of reactions. There's also the availability of using a mixed gas into a single gas channel where you can actually cause both a DRC or KED effect depending on the tuning of the cell. Nexions with their Synergistic software are able to optimize and control all these reactions and gas modes automatically through the software and the software will handle all of the gas mode switching for you. And then we also have the option of the Nexion 5000 with its multiple quadrupole acquisition modes. As I mentioned earlier in this talk, there's the huge amount of flexibility with having multiple quadrupoles, and here is really where it comes into play. So not only can you operate a Nexion 5000 in a single quadrupole mode, uh, but you can also run it in MSMS -MS mode and mass shift mode 
and we'll talk about those in the next two slides. But there's also the ability to do uh, ion scans, both precursor and product ion scans, so before the reaction and after the reaction cell to see what we're actually forming or what are the product, products going into the cell. So both of those can be useful when developing your methods. So the first example that I would like to show you of the multiple quadrupoles of the Nexion 5000 in removing interferences is a pretty classic example of trying to analyze vanadium in the presence of a chlorine background. The issue here is that Vanadium and its primary isotope is at mass 51 and it has a 99.75% abundance. So we definitely want to measure this isotope. Unfortunately, chlorine will readily form a polyatomic interference of chlorine oxide. And that also has a mass of 51. So without doing any type of interference removal, we'll have a very high signal for mass 51 and that's probably not going to be all of our vanadium signal. So we'll get a false positive of vanadium. So how can the Nexion 5000 and its multiple quadrupoles help to remove this background? Well, moving the ion stream through Q0, the QID, will reduce a lot of the chlorine background. But then we'll use Q1 to additionally filter out anything that's not at mass 51. So of course, this does not remove the chlorine oxide, that's still at mass 51. But in Q2, the universal cell, we're going to inject a flow of ammonia gas. And here we're going to do a proton transfer. We're essentially going to make a neutral of the chlorine oxide. It will fall out of the uh, quadrupole in the RF field. And we're also going to use the RPQ, the rejection parameter Q, to help prevent the formation of undesired species and to make sure that we have a very pure ion stream and ion signal going through Q3, the final filtering quadrupole, and onto the detector. In the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that there is a table showing that with the increased value of RPQ, we can actually see quite a difference between the background of a 10% hydrochloric acid and a 10% hydrochloric acid with a one part per billion vanadium spike in it. So the bandpass filtering definitely helps in addition to the other filtering quadrupoles to get a pure signal of vanadium. Another very useful tool with a multi-quadrupole ICPMS is mass shift mode. So here is an example where we're looking at titanium at mass 48. Again, this is a very high abundance isotope titanium it has a 74.3 percent abundance so it's very desirable to use this isotope of titanium but unfortunately there are a lot of naturally occurring interferences especially if you have a sample that's high in sulfur calcium or phosphorus but using the multi quadrupoles and reaction gases we can actually do quite an impressive thing so as we move this ion stream through the quadrupole ion deflector QID Q0. We're going to reduce a lot of the background so that as we get into the first transmission quadrupole Q1, we're going to filter out everything that's not mass 48. That still leaves some of those major interferences. But at Q2, we're going to inject ammonia gas into the universal cell and we're going to promote the formation of titanium ammonia clusters. Now, this will help us to then form these clusters that can go to a higher mass range away from these interferences. And we can send these clusters straight to the detector after we have set Q3 to whatever mass range we know that the uh, clusters will be formed at. And we know this by doing a product ion scan, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner. You can see these different spikes basically at every 17 mass unit intervals. Those are the different uh, clusters of the titanium and ammonia gas. So here we can see that we actually formed a very uh, prominent cluster at mass 131. So that's what we set Q3 to. And that will filter out all of the normal interferences that were existing at mass 48 and allow us to get a very clean signal for titanium.
And the final challenge, especially for labs that are running hundreds of samples or many multiples of samples uh, in every run, is long run stability. One of the contributors to long-term instability and drift is actually buildup of your sample or sample matrix on internal components, causing a change in performance. And that's where the quadrupole ion deflector and the triple cone interface come into their own. The triple cone interface helps to form a focused ion beam into the vacuum chamber and the ionized particles are then bent through 90 degrees by the quadrupole ion deflector, while the unionized particles, the neutrons and the photons, are removed from the system by the turbo. This combination means that only the ionized particles that you're targeting are making it into the rest of the ion optics, thus reducing background. It also helps to ensure that everything behind the cones remains as clean as possible. So there's less downtime, less maintenance needed. The key benefit of the triple cone interface is that we're actually trying to step down pressure more gradually. So by stepping down pressure more gradually, going from the atmospheric pressure to the vacuum, we're not having as much beam divergence. So we have a more focused beam fewer memory effects, and the internal components of the system, again, are trying to remain as clean as possible. And that's really through the addition of the hyperskimmer cone. The combination of these specifically designed subsystems really does contribute to better long-term stability, even on these high sensitivity instruments. The plot on the right shows measurements of a 50 PPT spike of 48 different elements in a 20% hydrochloric acid solution. And this was measured over more than five hours. Although it's not evident here, the RSDs are less than 4% for all elements. But what you can see is that the drift is less than 15% for all elements from the initial reading. And we were changing through different gas modes all throughout the readings. So some elements were read in an oxygen mass shift mode, others were read with uh, a ammonia gas mode, there was standard mode mixed in there. So with all these different changes, we still have great long-term stability. And so really the point here is we have multiple subsystems within these ICPMS instruments that will help get the best results possible even in challenging matrices. But now let's move on to some specific examples. So that brings us to the first analytical example I'd like to show you today. Uh, so this will be a case of analyzing rare earth elements and some other elements in lithium borate fused samples and using the multi-quadruple Nexion 5000. For this application, an external laboratory provided certified reference materials, CRMs, that had already undergone lithium metaborate tetraborate fusion and subsequent dissolution. The preparation dilution factor was a thousand times and an additional hundred times dilution with 0.5% nitric acid was applied before analysis. Both AMS and argon humidification were applied to the sample introduction to help better long-term stability. Blank solutions for the fusions were also provided so that calibration standards and blanks could be matrix matched. The standard concentrations were 0.2, 2, and 20 PBB for all elements, adding 200 and 400 PBB for aluminum, calcium, iron, potassium, magnesium, sodium, and silicon. An internal standard of rhodium was added in line using the switching valve of the high throughput system. And everything was analyzed on a Nexion 5000 ICPMS. As you can see in the table on the right, multiple cell modes were used to best utilize the interference removal capabilities of the Nexion 5000. 
The ion guide mode was set to focusing for all analytes to ensure the best background equivalent concentrations. But for the gas modes, we used standard mode for some elements as there were few interferences found. However, DRC mode with either mass shifting using pure oxygen or pure ammonia gas or staying on mass MSMS mode with the ammonia gas was used as well as a final mode where we mixed ammonia and hydrogen gas to help get the best interference removal possible for silicon. Values that are not listed in the table on the right were not certified for those CRMs. The accuracy of the methodology was established through the analysis of the three reference materials described previously. The analyte recoveries as provided in this graph show that 80% of the recoveries are within 5% of the certified values and 100% were within 10% of the certified values. As mentioned before, the universal cell's flexibility was fully utilized. For example, with silicon, ammonia and hydrogen were mixed online in the cell for best interference removal of both the nitrogen dimer and carbon monoxide that also exist at mass 28. Similarly, many of the rare earth elements were mass shifted using oxygen or ammonia gas to provide interference free masses to quantify. This graph shows the results of a spike recovery test, a 4 PBB spike, conducted on REE1 as an additional test of the accuracy where all elements were recovered within 10% of expected results. This spike level was too low for a proper spike recovery test on aluminum, calcium, iron, potassium, magnesium, sodium, and silicon in this CRM. And again, since the heavier REE elements are typically plagued by interferences from the oxides of lower mass REE elements, most of these elements were measured using a mass shift mode with the oxygen as a reaction gas in the cell. This was done to take advantage of the propensity of these elements to produce oxides quickly in a kinetically favorable reaction with mass shifts uh, that mass shifts them away from their on mass interferences. Long term stability was verified during a seven hour analysis of the lithium borate fused samples. The analytical run consisted of multiple fusions of each CRM, as well as matrix blanks and simulated samples in the same fusion matrix, all to demonstrate the effect of analyzing samples with high total dissolved solids on the sample introduction and internal components of the Nexion 5000 ICPMS. A 10 PBB rhodium internal standard was mixed in line through the HTS switching valve. There were eight different modes used in the method, switching between the multiple gases uh, and different modes for each one of those. All the internal standards recovered within 20% of their values to the calibration blank initially recorded. This further shows the validation of the robustness of this method and analytical instrument. The second application I'd like to share with you today is looking at the interferences of light rare earth elements on the heavier rare earth elements, especially when analyzing high purity rare earth element samples. In this application of high purity rare earth element samples on the Nexion 5000, we really had two different sample types. One was a 99.99% pure lanthanum, and the other was a 99% pure neodymium praseodymium sample. Now, the issue here is that these lighter rare earth elements readily form oxides and other interferences that can affect the heavier rare earth elements. So we wanted to use the multi-quadrupole Nexion 5000 ICBMS to control some of the reaction chemistry of the rare earth elements and detect them interference free. Our strategy was to create calibration curves of 50, 100, 500, and 1000 nanograms per liter of our target elements. And we would use reaction gases of both oxygen and ammonia. 
Oxygen was the dominant gas. The rare earth elements readily form oxides in the most case. However, some of the rare earth elements prefer uh, using ammonia gas, uh, and that was either for on mass measurements, so MSMS mode, or for clustering. And lanthanum, cerium, gadolinium, and terbium actually do form uh, these ammonia clusters. Let's consider the high purity lanthanum sample first. So here's a pretty familiar picture for you now, I would hope. Uh, we're looking at the ion pathway through the multiple quadrupoles of the Nexion 5000. And here's the strategy we're going to use when we're trying to remove the lanthanum hydride interference on cerium. So in the bottom right hand corner, again, you can see that there is a product ion scan uh, looking at the product of a ammonia cluster formation with both lanthanum, lanthanum hydride, and the cerium. So both of these are actually forming clusters. However, there is a preferential formation of the cerium and ammonia clusters at a higher mass range, at mass 241, compared to the cluster formations for the lanthanum hydride. So this is where we can target and tune Q3 and actually get a very accurate measurement for cerium. So again, following the ion pathway, Q0 is filtering out a lot of the background. Q1 is going to be set to mass 140, which is again where lanthanum hydride and cerium sit. We're going to inject the ammonia gas into Q2. Again, we're still going to be forming a lot of uh, clusters with both the lanthanum uh, hydride and the cerium, but thankfully there is a preferential formation of the ammonia clusters with cerium at mass 241, so we set Q3 to that mass. We're going to be rejecting all the uh, alanthanum hydride ammonia clusters, and we're going to get a very clean signal for the cerium. The other major issue with a high purity lanthanum sample is that if you wanted to measure gadolinium at mass 155, you'd have a major interference from lanthanum oxide. Now, thankfully, if you were going to react lanthanum oxide with more oxygen, it doesn't really form a lanthanum dioxide. But the gadolinium at mass 155 will readily form a gadolinium oxide and will shift up another 16 mass units. So again, we can set Q1 to mass 155. We'll have both the lanthanum oxide and the gadolinium coming through to Q2. Q2 will inject oxygen. We're going to form that gadolinium oxide. Lanthanum dioxide doesn't really form, but they're still going to pass through. And at Q3, we'll set it to a higher mass range, 16 mass units higher. So mass 171, the lanthanum oxide is rejected. Gadolinium oxide moves through and goes to the detector where we'll get accurate quantification of the gadolinium in this sample. So here are the results of our analyses of the high purity lanthanum and looking at the impurities. So looking at cerium and gadolinium, you can see in standard mode, the results were quite a bit higher, but when we use the power of the multi quadrupole system and we look at cerium reacted with ammonia to do a mass shift, we get a much lower and more accurate signal. And the same with gadolinium reacted with oxygen, we're getting a much lower signal there as well. So again, these are much more accurate results, not false positives that we would have had had we not had a multi quadrupole system. For the other sample type, the high purity neodymium praseodymium, some other key interferences to control were praseodymium oxide on gadolinium 157. So again, we have an issue here where the praseodymium forms an oxide quite readily, but it does not form a dioxide. So we can use, again, the mass shift using oxygen We'll set Q1 to the target analyte, 157. We'll use Q2 
with its dynamic bandpass tuning and its oxygen flow to remove uh, any side reactions, but also promote the formation of gadolinium oxide. Praseodymium does not form the dioxide, so we can shift Q3 to a higher mass, 173, where the gadolinium oxide exists. And we'll get a very pure signal of gadolinium oxide, and we can quantify gadolinium quite easily. And it's a similar story with neodymium. Neodymium does readily form an oxide, but it doesn't form a dioxide. So the oxide interferences on terbium, dysprosium, and erbium are negated by injecting this flow of oxygen to promote a mass shift of the terbium, dysprosium, and erbium to oxides at higher mass ranges so that we can get rid of the neodymium oxide interferences and get a pure signal for all of these target analytes. And here are the results for the high purity praseodymium neodymium. So in these samples, we were looking at the impurities of terbium, dysprosium, and erbium. You can see the comparison with the standard mode results versus the oxygen DRC results. And obviously, there's quite a bit of interference that was read back in the standard mode, giving us false positives, where the more accurate results and quantification was done in the oxygen DRC using a mass shift. So this is the true power of a multi-quadrupole system. In summary, the Nexion 5000 multi-quadrupole ICPMS provides solutions for accurate analysis of rare earth elements. It does this through systems such as the AMS, which does argon dilution to reduce plasma loading and help keep clones clean longer, through the EDR system to expand the dynamic range and allowing major and minor analyses on a single run by using the combination of the quadrupole ion deflector and triple cone interface, QID and TCI, to reduce background interferences and keep the instrument clean to minimize drift through the use of a solid state generator and the Lumi coil RF coil for increased robustness of the plasma and definitely through the use of the universal cell technology for interference correction and the use of multiple quadrupoles to control the mass charge selection at different stages for on mass or mass shift analyses. And finally, having the ability to have multiple gas channels allows in versatility for gas reaction choices and inline gas mixing. Thank you very much for attending my talk today. I hope that you found it useful and helpful. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. All right, just uh, getting back here, and I uh, guess we'll get to some of the questions. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed that talk. It, uh, it was a pretty detailed talk on, on rare earth element analysis. Obviously, there's there's a lot of different types of samples and so forth, and a lot of different you know types of potential interferences. But it gives you a good idea of, of the the power of the next gen um, five thousand in, in, in you know, mitigating some of those issues. Um, just Andrew, are you here? We'll start going. Yeah, I'm here. Through. Yeah. All right. Thank you, uh, everyone for uh, attending my talk, and yeah, I'm, I'm definitely uh, ready here to. Uh, answer all these uh, interesting questions that are coming in. All right. All right. Well, let's start. I'm just going to do this and present a couple extra things here. Um, so I guess one of the questions,
questions. We'll start with uh, how long does the average reading of this CRM take in the rare earth method? I guess they're talking about that, that rare earth method that you had where they were looking at the different REE uh, reference materials. Yeah, so for that one, uh, it wasn't just RE in the method, so it was a lot of the base metals and a lot of other uh, elements in the periodic table there, since those uh, CRMs were uh, um, uh, qualified for a lot of different uh, elements. I put them mm -hmm. up. It. But yeah, that one I got down to just over four minutes. I think it was four minutes and three seconds, four minutes and four seconds, something like that. And that's I not. Mean, how many isotopes were in there, do you think? There's quite a few isotopes, I think, in, in the end, right? Oh, yeah. Um, like, there was probably, oh, there was probably going upwards of, like, 85, 90. Yeah, so, so that's pretty good. I mean, a little over four minutes for 85, 90, multiple modes. Yeah, uh, plus eight upgrade. modes. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. I was, I was moving pretty quick. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, integration times. Um. So uh, next question in the list, uh, and I think we'll probably get this sort of question again. Um, we currently have a Nexium 300D. Is it possible to use this instrument to analyze rare earth elements? And, and they're asking in bio tissues, like tissue samples. Yeah. So, uh, so as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides in the, in the, uh, the presentation, when I was comparing our uh, uh, traditional single quadrupole instruments versus the, the multi quadrupole Nexion 5000. You know, for, for many years before they had multiple quadrupole instruments, uh, you know, people have been looking at uh, rare earth elements and quantification there. Uh, there's just uh, a little bit more uh, consideration you have to put into uh, towards what uh, type of possible interferences you might have so that you can ensure that you are quantifying uh, accurately. Um, and so with a 300D instrument, uh, one of the common strategies there is that uh, you can use uh, the KED uh, gas flow. So you can actually use the uh, kinetic energy discrimination with the helium gas to help try and remove some of the polyatomic interferences, especially the oxides. Uh, that can help. The downside of that is you can sometimes hurt your overall detection limit because it does attenuate your signal just a little bit when you go into KED mode. Uh, unfortunately, even some of your target analytes are slowed down a little bit by that. Uh, so that's one way. And we do know, uh, you know, again, you can do uh, some uh, total quant scans just to see what might be in your uh, samples of interest. And then you can see, uh, you know, maybe you'd have to use some ammonia gas to remove some of the interferences. Uh, the only problem is now uh, a lot of times we can't uh, institute that mass shifting that I was showing for the multi quadrupole instrument because you'd be mass shifting onto another uh, isotope. And then again, you'd have some bad false positives. So different strategies, it's still possible. Uh, it's just a little bit more consideration that needs to be done. Yeah, I, I agree. A little bit more consideration of, of you know, what the potential interferences are. But with, with tissue samples, I think, I mean, I think we get that question quite a few like different types of samples. With bio samples, they may not have the same, you know, you know distribution right. of elements as a, as a geochemical obviously right exactly, to, exactly. it'd be a little simpler so um and oftentimes the other advantage for the bio samples is they don't have as much of a dilution factor either so that's true uh, that's true detection limits there too mostly mostly carbon okay so um and that relates to we had another question similarly on the traditional single quad, so you kind of answered it there. Um, then you we have a question. You only mentioned three reaction gases: ammonia, oxygen, and hydrogen. Can we use other reaction gases? And what would you choose, or what would be the benefit? Yeah. So uh, in, in my uh, method, there I, I was using pretty much three of the most common uh, gases, but you're not restricted on really any uh, Nexion instrument, even, even our older ones, about what uh, gases uh, you can and can't use. So there are some people who uh, will use methane uh, as a reaction gas. It, it works in a lot of similar ways to what ammonia does. It's just not quite as reactive. Uh, and there are some uh, elements that is not as effective as ammonia gas, but it, it is still a good one. 
Uh, some people will use uh, pure sources of uh, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, so you can get really pure carbon dioxide. Obviously, you're using that for lasers. You want pure ones there. But carbon dioxide actually has better uh, reaction kinetics sometimes than just pure oxygen uh, when you're trying to uh, create an oxide of uh, sometimes of the interferon. Um, then there's other ones. I mean, you could get into fancy things like ozone. Ozone is super reactive. We haven't done too much testing with that, but it's possible for uh, some better improvements with something like that too. So really, there is no restriction on the gas. Uh, you're definitely uh, free to explore. Uh, which I, I know I always get a question too, like uh, a lot of people ask about, um, you know, if I get a Nexium 5000, is it only reaction or can I still do my collision methods? <laughs> I yeah. get that one too. I'm like, yeah, you can still use collision. Um, obviously, yeah. you know, the extra quadrupole really helps you do reactions better, um, but uh, but yeah, you can still do collisional you know um, um, work in there using kinetic energy discrimination. For sure, there's there's still a, a role for that too, and it, we we know like the the base metals, the first uh, row of the transition metals there, they perform excellently in uh, KED mode. So I mean, there's there's no real reason why you couldn't do that, but the other thing with the multi quadrupoles is uh, you can do mass uh, mass shifts on elements that you wouldn't normally do. Like you could do titanium 48 mass shifted with oxygen up to uh, mass 74, which would have been zinc. But mm -hmm. now you have multiple quadrupoles, you can get rid of that too. So you can do a lot of fancy things you couldn't do before. So yeah, yeah, I agree. There's there's some there's a lot more options uh, and for. Uh, for you know accurate quantitation there's, there's a lot of options to go through and and confirmation data too sometimes running things in two modes helps you be more confident in your data that's exactly um, point too. um um i had a, you had a question here andrew uh stevie he's asking please show slide 39 again so i'm just going to pull up slide 39 he's asking i did not have time to see the strategy here. Um, oh, I guess you're, I mean, this is a pretty big yeah. eye chart. <laughs> so I, I can see why you didn't have time to see the strategy here. There's a lot of text on here. Um, and to Steve too, uh, if you look in the handout section, there is a, uh, oh, yeah. a note of this work as well. So you can actually get a copy of that too. And that, that table is in there, right? Yep, that table is yeah. in there. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So if you if go to the handout uh, and, and feel free to download that uh, handout, um, and a lot of this stuff is explained a little bit more as well in that handout too. Um, so I think in the application notes. So um, yeah, yeah. Of course, you know you can always you know when you review the application note and you have additional questions, you know feel free to reach out to. Uh, uh, you know, either of us and try and answer them for you. Yeah, exactly. Happy to answer any questions that come in. All right. What's the next one here? Um, okay. So, question is um, why do you use, why is there a quadrupole versus, you know, I think they. I think the question is, what's the benefit of a quadrupole over an octuple or octuple reaction system? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a good question too. So, in in our Nexions, uh, we've been using a, a quadrupole in the reaction cell basically since we've had a reaction cell, um, and and really the the purpose of that is uh, that dynamic bandpass tuning, that ability there to use those. Those values of the RPA, which I talked about as a, uh, uh, so that's rejection parameter A, uh, that's in um, the attenuation mode, that EDR mode I was talking about. But there's also something that really wasn't evident in those talks there, uh, and especially in reactions. I guess there was one slide there where I talked about the RPQ tuning of the bandpass tuning, and that's uh, rejection parameter Q, uh, and we use that to help. Uh, tune out some of the possibility of having some side reactions that were unwanted in the reaction cell. So when you're injecting a highly reactive gas like ammonia, you can get not only your desired reaction, but some side reactions as well. So if 
by using that dynamic bandpass tuning, it definitely helps. And that's something that uh, like a hexapole system or an octopole uh, system cannot do. Uh, they're more of an ion guide. Um, so they're, they still work, they're an ion guide, they'll, they'll work in collision mode, but they're not as good in reaction mode. And especially when we're working with, uh, you know, uh, the multi quadrupole system and, and we do make use of those reactions even more. Yeah. It's definitely more of a benefit than ever. Well, I like to also explain like, like all those, all those things that are guiding ions, the quadrupole, ion deflector, all, all those things. They're all working in tandem as well. They're all kind of working in, in, in tandem to to get the best product, right? Uh, the, what we want hitting the detector, <laughs> mm -hmm. ultimately. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I had a you had a question. Does the QID quadrupole ion deflector have a carryover effect? And uh, if it, I guess, if it happens to be analyzed with high concentration, um, did, or I guess one example, you know, did you see any carryover effects in the system with these, these lithium fusions or anything like that? Oh uh, yeah, okay. So I understand what you're getting at there. Uh, you know, if it's if it's uh, you know carrying over from sample to sample, if you see some carryover, or you think uh, the internal surfaces are getting dirty somehow, or anything like that. And the answer to that is is really no, not in the samples that I was running, uh, even with the lithium borate fusion. Uh, those those samples uh, didn't see any real carryover. And that's part of the design of the quadrupole ion deflector is that really there shouldn't be any contact with the ion stream with the poles of that quadrupole ion deflector. Uh, so really it's... Yeah. It's not, uh, you know, designed to be like a one AMU kind of design there, where we're getting fine tuning. But we are really trying to filter out the background there and a lot of the undesirable stuff, all the yeah. ones and the neutrals, to keep our background exactly. as low as possible. Exactly, exactly. Reduce that, and you know everything. But I actually, I actually just had a customer this end of last week go, oh, I swear that quadfine deflector is dirty. It's dirty. So we had service go on site, and we ran. Uh, they're they're blanks. Yeah, there's all this background. Then we ran a different blank from a different source outside of their facility, and everything came down. It ended up being dirty acids, uh, you know, uh, and bad yeah. water. <laughs> and that's that's but, the unfortunate uh, side product of uh, having more and more sensitive instruments too, right? They're going to show off any kind of contamination that you might have. So yeah, yeah, you gotta. Everything needs to be dialed in. Yep. Um, a good question here. I, I know we've hit the hour, but this is, I can think a couple good questions here. Uh, we'll do these two last questions here. Um, how can we overcome doubly charged ions? That's, that's always a good discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So double charged ions, you know, that's still a problem where, you know, whatever the, the actual mass of it, it appears when it's double charged to be half the mass of its, its actual normal self. Uh, so that can fall on some of the lower elements. And one of the nice things about the uh, uh, Nexion 5000, even uh, you know some of the other ones too, the the 1000 and 2000, is you can you can tune the uh, mass spectrometer and the filtering uh, quadrupoles down below half an AMU. Uh -huh. and we've got some, or maybe something in the works about that, but there have been some internal tests on that, and you can actually identify peaks from. Uh, half mass interferences that way. Uh, that's that's a really good way. You can tune the system as well to have uh, low half mass uh, interference in the tuning of it. Uh, and uh, you know, mostly with the the multi quadrupole systems, it's it's uh, tuning um, based on on the quadrupoles, and you're doing uh, a filtering out of those those other interferences. But uh, on the single quadrupole systems. It's more of a, a tuning and optimization to keep your uh, uh, double charge formation as low as possible. Mm -hmm. And I found I, you, since the sensitivity is so high, I was, I was testing it myself, just kind of playing around. Since sensitivity is so high, it's actually, if you change the res to like just under half an AMU, like you know, 0.45 or so, or you know, even 0.5 it considerably reduces the, the, you know, the double charge that are usually showing up. A lot of them are at half mass, right? So you can, yeah, so it actually works great. And you're, and you're only losing, you know, 30% sensitivity or so, 40% max uh, sensitivity, which is, 
negligible since you're background limited anyway most of the time exactly that's um, a good point too. most of the time right most of the time it's background limited so um so yeah so uh, one last question before we go here um um can you use cold plasma that, or does cold plasma favor the recovery of rare earth elements? Um, so, yeah, I, I would say probably not. Uh, yeah. The real purpose of cold plasma is to get away from argon based interferences. Uh, so that's, that really helps a lot too. And especially when you've got easily ionizable elements, uh, it's not really favorable to use cold plasma. I don't think you'd see much of a benefit if you, if you use cold plasma conditions on rare earth elements. Yeah, yeah, that, and also, it also depends on the matrix, right? So um, if, you're, you're, if you're doing a lot of plasma loading, in this case, they're fusion samples, there's a lot of, you know, lithium and boron in there. So um, I, I wouldn't recommend with, with that much loading. <laughs> they're really clean samples. You could play around with going to cold plasma that, as Andrew said, that we really we use on very, a cleaner sort of matrix usually uh, less TDS and so forth um, right yep. yeah yeah um, all right well you know thank everybody thank you Andrew that was, that was great and uh, I know we're a little bit over the hour so just a reminder to everybody you know I send out emails you know personal emails uh, regularly kind of update people on, on what webinars I'm putting it together um, and you can always go to this link here and I'll You'll have it in your email as well to see what's coming up and what we've talked about in the past, so our sort of on-demand webinars. So again, thank you, Andrew, um, for your presentation, and thank everybody for uh, spending some time with us today attending this webinar. If you have any questions, please contact myself or Andrew, and uh, and we'll uh, you know try and answer them as best as possible. And once you leave today's webinar, uh, you'll receive a, a brief survey on the presentation, and uh, we could appreciate any feedback. I, I usually check those out a couple days after and see if there's any other topics that uh, you desire. Uh, you'll also receive a follow-up email within about 24 hours with a link to view this recording. So on behalf of Perkin Elmer, and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day, week, month. Take care.